He showed you how much he loves you by dying for you. He showed you the extent of his love. How much do you love him? Do you really love him? On this good Friday morning, examine the love that you have for him. You find it hard to get up on a Sunday morning. You find it even hard to come here in time. And you say you love him? We can respond this morning in one of three ways. Some people respond by an outright rejection of God. Even today, throughout the world, there's an outright rejection. When some new rights and new rules have been written, where people with evil and sin in their hearts are getting the upper hand, they have chosen to reject God and everything that He says and stands for. These people want absolutely nothing to do with God. In fact, they even despise the very mention of His name. Isn't it sad? The third vice president of the United States, a man by the name of Aaron Burr, was reared in a very godly home. He was admonished at a very early age to accept Jesus Christ and to follow the Lord by his grandfather. His grandfather was none other than Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was one of those great men of God that was used to bring about a great revival in America. One of his greatest sermons known and read and heard by millions of people and stared the hearts of so many people, sinners, in the hands of an angry God. And here we have the grandson of that great man and he decided that he wanted to have nothing to do with God. He made it clear that he wants nothing to do with God. He wished simply for God to leave him alone. Although he did achieve political success, his life was filled with strife and hate. At the age of 48, he killed a man called Alexander Hamilton. And throughout his life, Evan Bear remained very unhappy. Toward the end of his life, Alexander, uh, sorry, Bear told a group of friends, 60 years ago, I told God to leave me alone. I would not want him to bother me in 60 years he has not bothered me sad to say Aaron Bear got what he wanted his outright rejection of God nothing to do with God most people come to that stage in their lives and they want nothing to do with God Please leave me alone, God. I want to live my life my way. I have no room for you in my life. And so many would come out and outright reject God. Reject the love that he has for them. Many of you, secondly, can be indifferent to God. You don't reject God. But you're just indifferent. You are not on fire. You're cold. It doesn't matter about God. God is by the way. Your other programs are more important. While you're sitting here, your mind is already working out where you must go and what you're going to do. Your mind is not here. Your body is here. You're just indifferent. You say you love God. But then you act as if it doesn't matter in your life. You are the architect of your life. You will do what you want to do. It's simply not that important to you. And if the truth be told, if your rights as a Christian have been taken away and should be taken away tomorrow, it would make no difference to you. You would say like most people, I can pray at home. It doesn't matter. 
I'm still a Christian. I don't know what kind of Christian that would be. You indifferent and indifference to the love of God is just as bad as outright rejection. And the church is full of people who are indifferent. It doesn't matter. But amazingly enough, in spite of all our rejection and indifference, God still loves you. Isn't that amazing? God still loves us. Even though Jerusalem had turned away from God, God still said, Oh, how I long to gather your children together as a hen gathers its shakes under her wings. Even in our rebellion, God desires to hold us close to him. Oh, how he loves us. A while back, I came across a story about a family whose 20 year old son had become quite rebellious. He spent his nights wasting away with drink and parties, and he constantly spared the parents' love. One night, in a drunken stupor, he appeared at his father's house, stumbled through the door, and passed out on the floor. As the father was about to wake him up and kick him out of the house, the mother gently knelt down beside him, placed his head on her lap, and caressed his hair. When the father began to speak, she said, Shh! This is the only time I get to hold him. He's still my son. I want to hold him. Oh, the love of a mother for a son is the same kind of love that the father has for us. She said, there isn't a time when I can really hold him like this. There isn't a time when I can really caress him. He had passed off in this drunken stupor. I can do that now. I want to love him. No matter how bad we've been, no matter how faith, unfaithful we've been, God still loves us. In the Bible there's a story of a parent's unconditional love. It's a story of David and his son Absalom. Absalom rebelled against his father's unconditional love and David didn't retaliate like most fathers would. Absalom conspired to overthrow the father and to make himself king. In doing this he won the hearts of most of the people and David was forced to flee for his life. Fleeing from his very own son. When David and his followers fought back and eventually turned the tide of the battle, and when news came back to David that his son Absalom was dead, how did he respond? Second Samuel chapter 18 and verse 33 says, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and he wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I died instead, instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David's heart was filled with love for his son Absalom in spite of his rebellion. God still loves the sinner today and he calls him to repent and turn back to him. Some respond to God's love with rejection. Some respond with indifference. 
and yet still respond to God's love by loving him back. And when we accept that love, dear brothers and sisters, we find that our lives are made totally and complete. And though we have rebelled against God by his grace, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, in it we find pardon and peace. And it's that love that motivates our love for him. See, during the early days of the Civil War, I read of a, a soldier that was uh, sentenced to die because he deserted his post. His appeal was uh, handled somehow by the President Abraham Lincoln. The President somehow felt mercy for him and signed a petition. The soldier was asked to go back to battle and he fought tirelessly for his country and finally was killed in the last battle. When they retrieved his body, found in his breast pocket was a letter signed by the president. Close to the heart of the soldier were the leader's words of pardon. And those words kept him going, kept him fighting, kept him on the battlefront because it was the president that said, I forgive you. And because of this pardon, he was prepared to lay down his life for his country. Let me then tell you, God loves you. He gave his son to die for you. When you rebelled, he remained steadfast. When you were unfaithful, he remained faithful. Now of all, he loved and he loves you today and he calls you to himself. Can you see him on the cross? Amen. Can you see him with his wide open arms? Can you see him with the blood oozing out of every wound on his body? No matter our situation or our status of life, we can come whatsoever or whosoever, the Bible says, not the rich, not the poor, but whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, are you saved? Are you saved from sin? Are you saved from your old life? Or are you one of those just indifferent? You're a church goer. Church goers are not saved. Church goers won't really go to heaven. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, Christ never turned anyone away who came to him seeking forgiveness and a relationship. And he calls every one of us to him. But if we reject that call, then the result is that we've rejected ourselves. He does not reject you. But you will reject yourselves when you do not come to him. You see folks, God does not reject us. But we reject God. God is patient with our mistakes. He is long-suffering with our stumbles. He doesn't get angry at our questions. He doesn't turn away when we turn against Him. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, let's turn to Jesus today. Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 21, says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts became darkened. Although they claimed to would be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. And that's what we have done. We've rejected God and we've made idols for ourselves. We might not be idol worshippers, but we are in the real sense. Because what 
possessions we have, birds and animals and cars and whatever else have been little idols that have become more precious to us than God is. And so God gave, gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. Did you get that last verse there? God gave them over. There's an old saying that says, be careful what you ask for, you might just get it. And if you don't want God to bother you, He'll simply leave you alone. If you say, I'm not interested, I'm doing well without God, then that is very dangerous. But his heart's cry, if you're going to hear this morning, is, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers the chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look at your house, it is left to be desolate. I tell you that you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now dear brothers and sisters, let me ask you again, how will you respond on this Good Friday morning? Have you rejected God in your life? Do you simply want him to leave you alone so that you can do what you want to do? Live your life the way you want to live it? We read about the prodigal son. Often wondered what his life was like when he returned home. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about that. Do you think he ever neglected time with his father but after he got back home? Do you think he was sort of indifferent to his father and to his home after coming back from the big sty? I sometimes wonder what kind of relationship did he have with his father when he came back? I'm sure he would, would have loved to spend lots of time with the father. I'm sure he would sit with the father and have breakfast with the father and lunch with the father. The older brother would probably say, hey, we've got to work outside. I want to be with father. I love him so much. I love him so much. Father would be saying, don't worry about the work. The work will be done. I'm just enjoying my son. I'm just enjoying my son. You hear this morning, your name. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, it could be, oh, Harry, Harry. You kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have you longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers its chicks under her wings, but you were not willing? Look, look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you. You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How do we respond this morning? Do you see the Savior outstretched on the cross? Do you see the agony that is portrayed in his suffering? It's a picture of rejection. He's rejected. Rejected by the people he came to love. Rejected by the people he came to lay down his life for. They are not there. The people who said they loved him most. The people who said they will stand with him. Nobody is there. He's a man of sorrows. He's a man rejected. Rejected. 
If you're being rejected by us today, by you today, you've got time for everything else. You're such a busy man, such a busy woman. Your diary is full, your commitments are full. Have you considered the Lord in your program? Are you so busy that people take preeminence in your program? Your family takes preeminence, your brothers and sisters, but not the Lord? You're being rejected all over again. All over again. And he says to us, those that will receive him, he's given them the power to be the sons of God, to be the children of God, to enjoy the benefits of the home of God. respond to him today? How do you respond?